Um, yeah, Richard's joined us tonight to um, tell us that hopefully some of his, some of the stories he's allowed to tell us about flying and experiences and see if we can add some kind of principles of flying to, to maybe explain why some of the things we do is so difficult with the thin air that we sometimes operate in, etc. Now uh, then, we've got uh, Mr. Veach on board as well. I think I might have to defer to his experience. He he was my boss at one point. <laughs> really? That was many years ago. In fact, the picture behind us is you and me together lifting the links. Ah, and what a fabulous um, one day of the, that was. One of the stories I was, uh, one of the anecdotes I was reading, I can't remember which number it is, but it was about your landing on that, um, on that uh, sort of pinnacle on a glacier. And it was, it was 20,000 feet, wasn't it? In, a, in an old outlet or a llama. Yes, um, I mean, I, I'm going to put my hand up straight away and say it wasn't me actually doing the flying. <laughs> um, and um, uh, the, the landing site itself was, um, was on a pinnacle of ice uh, at 22,000 feet in the, in the Himalayas. Um, and it was, it was an extraordinary feat of um, airmanship and skill. Um, I came away with a, uh, with a very uh, profound respect for the Indian Air Force Squadron that, um, that do that particular mission up in the, uh, in the Himalayas. Mm. Um, and um, you know, one of the challenges um, was, of course, was judging speeds. Um, so difficult being up in a, in a glacier field where the um, visual perception problems are quite significant. Um, but also, of course, uh, yeah, you, uh, you have the issue with um, indicated airspeed versus true airspeed. Yeah. Um, perhaps, so perhaps one of your uh, um, online guests would like to uh, delve into that. Absolutely. Uh, in, uh, so, so judging approach speeds will be very challenging. He wants to do and, um, the, uh, and the other challenge was, um, was obviously the performance of the actual helicopter itself, the single engine alouette. Um, uh, uh, operating at the very limits of its um, of its performance, um, and uh, once below a certain uh, a certain speed, um, with no overshoot option, so there was only one way you were going, and that was down to the landing site. Um, so yeah, a very interesting um, a couple of days out. I bet. And had you flown with that pilot before, or was it a case of just complete trust that they'd done this a few times, and I'm sure he'll hit the mark. Um, it, it was a, a matter of trust, absolutely. Um, I've not flown with the um, Indian Air Force um, before, um, up until then. Um, uh, and uh, I only met the pilot um, uh, for, for the briefing just before uh, we, uh, we, went, uh, we went off. So we left the base camp at um, 15,000 feet uh, and climbed up over uh, a ridge line at um, 17 and a half. Uh, and before we hit the base of the glacier and then just started climbing, I've, climbing, climbing, climbing. Um, flying similar in Norway. I think Chris Veach has two, if, I, if I'm correct, Chris, have you done the Norway debts? Um, and um, flying up on the, on the Hardanger um, area on a, on a glacier, which um, has exactly the same problem, but obviously at significantly lower altitudes. Uh, but for those of you who will go on to fly uh, around the United Kingdom, now, these sort of challenges exist here as well. So if you find yourself flying in, uh, uh, in the um, uh, valleys in Wales, for example, you can very, very easily get caught out uh, by exactly the same issues. Uh, and likewise, in some areas in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, so having an appreciation um, of, the, uh, of the potential gotchas um, is really important um, before, you, uh, before you venture off into those, uh, into those areas. Uh, particularly in the winter Norway, um, yeah. and um, there's um, there's a classic example of just that, uh, which has caught many pilots out over the years. Um, it's when they're flying over forests, um, and um, uh, we all have a mental model of how tall the average tree is. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, when we're when we're flying, we base our own um, height on on those trees. So the tree on average is about fifty to seventy feet. So therefore, I must be at say two hundred. But, but thing we're with in Norway and it happens in Scotland as well is that a lot of those forests are newly planted so a lot of those trees are only two feet tall mm. so there are pilots flying around thinking that they were about 150 <laughs> 200 feet but actually there are about anywhere between 20 and 30 or 40 uh, and consequently um, some flew into the into the ground um, but despite thinking that they were significantly higher uh, than that um, so again, that just comes down to depth perception 
and your uh, and your ability to relate objects um, uh, to um, uh, to an expected height, um, which is a great skill, and every helicopter pilot needs to have that. But just be aware that visual illusions, like like the small trees, are, are out there. Which is why when you do your um, ground school training, I'm sure you've all covered in under human factors things like um, uh, visual illusions, um, because they certainly do exist. They can be immensely um, convincing, um, and um, and that background knowledge, that uh, theory, um, really does help. To um, to fight um, the uh, the illusion uh, and to and to overcome it and to stay safe. Okay, so I in see. your blog, you talked about going into a vortex ring in a chinook, and that <coughs> before all the instruments alarmed off, you just felt that something wasn't right in the aircraft. What was it you sensed? Ah, okay. Um, yes, that was um, I was in the Falkland Islands. Um, one night, uh, very very dark night before MVGs, um, and um, we uh, were making um, what we call night sun approaches to um, basically a pole stuck in the ground with reflective tape on it, uh, and the night sun is a very very powerful um, light fitted to the front uh, of uh, of a helicopter, and we had one on the Chinook, um, and you would light it up and then uh, point the beam roughly in the area where you thought the flagpole was, and then you'd scan until you saw a reflection coming back, and then you would make an approach um, uh, to that flagpole. Uh, the way that we used to do it was we'd, we'd have, um, uh, have, a, have an idea where it was uh, on the ground, we'd fly towards the area, we'd pick it up in the beam, fly it over, top, over the top, and then mark it with what was quite, um, um, quite a rudimentary navigation equipment back then, basically just used Doppler um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and some airspeed data uh, as well. So pretty basic compared to today's GPS, for example, and, um, uh, and EGI systems. Uh, and then we would fly a pattern based on that to come back um, into, uh, into wind, pointing the night sun at the pole and then at a at a certain distance based on our overhead fix start, start a descent gradually reducing the airspeed keeping the pole in in the light so that we could fly to it um, and then for every mile we would we would anticipate losing 300 feet in a controlled descent um, now on this particular occasion um, what um, what happened was uh, I was I was new in theatre, so it's my first time in the Falklands. Um, and it was the first time I'd done one of these night sun approaches, so it was being demonstrated to me um, by a very experienced and very capable um, instructor. Um, and um, in fact, he works in the building with me now. We still chat about it on occasion. Um, and um, as he was flying it, he was pattering it to me. So. Um, tell it, saying out loud exactly what he was doing and when and why um, and for me to take note so that when I had my go I would be able to um, replicate it um, and everything was very convincing it was very calm it was a v in the Falklands there there is no there is no light it was absolutely jet black so all we had was the beam of light uh, and this um, pole and um, as, you, as you say, at one point, something didn't feel right. Um, and it took me a while as I, when I scanned the instruments, because I was focused on the pole and I was, and I was listening to what, um, to what my instructor was saying. Um, and it wasn't um, until I scanned the VSI that I noticed that we had a very large rate of the on. Um, and then my immediate um, uh, um, uh, reaction then was to check the airspeed and we had um, less than 30 knots uh, indicated and in fact the Chinook airspeed indicator back then didn't have less, uh, anything uh, under 30, it was 30 and then nothing. Um, so as you might imagine um, that was quite alarming uh, at which point I called, uh, I called for power exactly the same time that the radar went off and the radar was quite low at 400 feet um, and with over 3,000 feet per meter rate of ascent, we really didn't have much time. 
Um, now, thankfully, um, the, uh, the Chinook is a bit of a beast, and certainly when it comes to um, uh, principles of flight and aerodynamics, it can be, um, it can be quite um, uh, difficult to uh, work out exactly what it's doing at any given time. Um, and on this occasion, it decided to completely ignore the, um, the issue of vortex ring. Um, and um, rather than settling with power and continuing down or indeed accelerating, um, it, um, it just shook itself and shot straight up like a cork out of a bottle. Um, and um, we literally went straight up. Um, and uh, as we passed through about 2,000 feet, we were able to breathe again um, <laughs> and uh, decided to call it a night uh, and head back to uh, Mount Pleasant Airfield. Uh, in order to dissect what um, has happened. So, um, some really important lessons um, there. Um, the question, why did we end up in that situation? And it comes back to the visual illusion um, issue that I spoke of um, uh, just a moment ago. And there's a real challenge with making an approach to a single point of reference, um, because the brain starts to do funny things. Um, and you have things like autokinesis where the, um, the single point target that you're looking at, it happens particularly with light at night, uh, will apparently seem to start to move. So you will start to follow it. Um, so that's one issue that you will have. Um, but that's just your brain doing that. Obviously, it's not moving uh, unless you happen to have chosen um, a vehicle with a single tail light and you're following it around the countryside. Um, but the other issue is that um, descending into a dark pool with one beam of light one one reflecting light back at you there's no external frame of reference other than your instruments so if you don't get the balance between the, that external reference and your internal reference on the instrument panels you can very quickly lose that vital situational awareness and at night in particular um, the senses really really struggle um, to work out uh, things like um, uh, you know approach rate um, and uh, and speed uh, speed along. Um, so we we're very we we're very lucky. But but the but the absolute lesson uh, for us was that uh, was that we needed to increase our, our scanning uh, of the uh, instruments uh, and not allow ourselves to become fixated on the landing spot that um, that we were uh, that we were aiming for. And it was a very powerful lesson. Uh, I was lucky to get away with it. Um, but it's certainly one which I've always communicated um, to. Uh, anyone and everyone that I've, I've flown with um, ever since. Um, be, you know, beware that single point of reference and make sure that when your instructor teaches you to balance between external um, reference, look out and internal reference, we do it for a very good reason. Um, you know, uh, the, otherwise, um, you can risk getting caught out um, and, uh, and it could uh, be uh, for, for the worse. Um, but, We've passed on the experience to you now, so hopefully um, you, won't, you won't suffer from it. Okay, thank you. It's another it's a really another good occasion one. when I was uh, flying okay. in a Merlin um, at night. Now, the Merlin was very different to the, um, uh, to the Chinook. Um, and Chris will attest to this, Chris Reach, that when, you, when, you, when you've flown a Chinook for a while, you can tell exactly how fast it's going by by the amount your eyeballs are vibrating or, um, or your internal organs are shaking around. Um, whereas a, a, a Merlin, um, a much, much smoother beast. Um, and um, I was flying one night, um, low level. Um, it was a very dark night in the UK, but um, very calm, there was no wind. And where we were, there was very little light. And it got to the point where I realized that I had no sensation of speed and it actually felt as if we were hovering mm. every time i checked the airspeed and i had i had that autopilot engaged as well um we were doing 130 knots but everything told me that we were hovering mm. everything so it was that vital balance between um you know looking out trusting your um, instruments uh, and then fighting through um those those illusions so there can be visual there can be physical illusions um, they can come in many forms um, and the best way to um, uh, to uh, uh, to understand them is is to read about them and to know about them that's where the human factors is really really important we place a lot of emphasis on it um, in the uh, in the military um, uh, so um, uh, so again i encourage you um, that one book that you you read sat the exam and then i've parked it somewhere in a in a box 
uh, underneath the stairs. Don't. Uh, I've still got my copy on a bookshelf right in front where, where I see it every time I go to my bookshelf. And I'll pull it out and I'll refresh myself on it. Uh, and then I've got a mandatory um, three-year refreshment with the Royal Air Force um, where we have to go and do the course all over again because it's that important. <laughs> well, I, I, my first tour, there were two pilots. We, we were flying in uh, Northern Ireland in the West, in Wessex, and we were both got to a thousand hours pretty much on the same sortie. And stupidly, we put the aircraft into Vortex Ring deliberately. <laughs> and I have a very, very healthy respect for it. Yeah. It's, we uh, started at 8,000 feet and we recovered at 1,400 feet. Oh, wow. That took a while to recover then. Yeah. And when it, and the textbook says, random pitch roll and yaw, <laughs> you have the playing card, that's exactly what it was like. What type of helicopter, what, type, what helicopter type was that? Wessex. A Wessex from 8,000 feet to 1,400. Yeah. Wow. That's a heck of a height loss, isn't it? The crewman refused to fly with us again. And <laughs> never but it, it is. But it did come out of it, but I think it was by luck rather than once it's fully developed and the, and the rotors are stalled. Um, the, the Wessex blades are very narrow, so they're, they're quite long, but they're quite narrow. They don't have the cord. Um, and there's, a, there's a, um, a theory that the Chinook can power out of Vortex Ring. I've never tried it, and I don't think the test pilots have tried it. Okay. Um, but, um, the Wessex certainly couldn't, and it was both of us had the stick fully forward, and we were just waiting. So we do try and we do, um, do it in the simulator, but not in a real aircraft. I was going to say, I, I thought you might have a simulator. You could do it in yeah. simulator. I think with simulators, is that, um, they're, they're only as good as the one and ones and noughts that you dial into them. Um, and it's very, very hard um, to, uh, to map the, the, the true behaviour of a helicopter um, in, in, in all the um, uh, conditions that it might find itself in. So the fidelity generally is, is good, um, getting better, but um, as soon as you've got anyone with experience on, on a type of helicopter and put them in, put them in or, or her in, um, they will say, well, this isn't quite right. This doesn't feel quite right. You know, this is not how the real helicopter um, uh, would act. And, and they're right, because ultimately it's just ones and, ones and noughts. And you're trying to, um, you're trying to emulate what, um, what the aircraft um, would, uh, would do. Um, so um, the simulated technology has come a long way. But again, you need to understand that it has its, has its limitations. And there is no substitute for actually flying, flying the real thing. Um, but I appreciate that um, uh, you know, expense uh, comes into it, um, and um, uh, clearly uh, you, you need to fly uh, what you can afford. Um, my only message would be is, um, uh, is is to fly as much as you can afford, um, uh, and um, uh, and that way you can safeguard and safeguard yourselves as you go forward. Yeah, simulate uh, uh, limitations. Uh, 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 so Chris. Coming down to a balance and a balance of risk, and in today's health and safety orientated world, um, practicing manoeuvres like engine off landings. Now we don't do them in Kuwait. We don't fly engine off landings anymore because we were bending more aircraft practicing them than we ever had from engine failures. Yep. It took so, so we have generations of pilots now who've never landed a helicopter without an engine. In the, in the PPL world, it, it used to be the same sort of thing. You know, it was engine off landings for, for students always had to beat to the ground and and you take the poor R22 which was always the, the bread and butter of the flying schools that they were getting ridden off the front and centre mm -hmm. and eventually finally the the, um, the authorities woke up to the that's probably a bit rude to me they recognised I think that we we're actually just risking everybody breaking aircraft for something that actually rarely ever happens and um, if we do these to successfully to safely to the powered recovery, if you can do a nice flare level and bring it back to the hover at five feet off the ground, the last five foot is not the issue. It's that falling and not being out of flare and hitting the ground because you didn't maintain the airspeed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, yeah, there's a few exercises now that we emergencies are discussing only. I can remember the day, you know, when we used to practice um, tower rotor failures in the hover. I mean, it was terrifying. As a poor student, the instructor puts a boot full of the 
the uh, the non-power pedal in your pilot helicopter starts whizzing round the outside world of just a blur that's it go on pull that's it close that throttle that's it cushion the landing <laughs> and um, yeah terrifying so they're discussion points only nowadays and we sometimes show a little bit of it just to stem just to prove the theory does actually work but you know you take um the cabri g2 if you if you're really not careful and you demonstrate a terror to fail in the hover and then try to demonstrate that closing the throttle will stop the yaw that works fine but then when you open the throttle again the the rotors and all of our cabri students have had all this discussion and whatnot the rotors work so well that um they carry on flying they don't stall but the fenestrum's just not turning fast enough and can develop quite enough torque to to or anti-torque to cope with the torque reaction and you carry on going round and the port spirals into the ground so there's been a few experienced instructors but not experienced in the cabri they've actually crashed them trying to demonstrate tarot of failures in the hover for instance um have you ever um in any of your flying certainly at high altitudes experienced any over pitching for instance richard um do you know i i i haven't um but um uh i i've certainly operated the merlin to um to the edge of its um uh, envelope uh, in uh, in Iraq. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, the su southern Iraq is is pretty much flat. It's at it's at sea level, but temperatures are regularly um, over fifty degrees um, Celsius. Um, so um, that 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 produces a, a real challenge because obviously the, den the density altitude. I say obviously, um, but the density altitude is very high as a, as a consequence. Um, so um, we would um, quite often uh, find ourselves um, having to uh, over pitch for some uh, some of the landings. Um, so it it almost it almost became um, a routine, which of course it shouldn't have done. Um, but if we wanted to get into the landing sites and uh, and deliver the um, the troops or the cargo, then uh, uh, then you accepted that um, there was a risk that you might run out of. Um, uh, power and ended up having to over pitch um, at the at the bottom end, but then the um, the process was that you would ensure that um, you would have a safe safe run on, um, so the site that you were going right. into would allow you um, to uh, to do that. Um, I never had that problem in uh, in a Chinook. I don't know about you, Chris. Um, never. Yeah. But it does it bring, brings to mind? I I, I spent um, uh, some time flying. Um, uh, for uh, for a commercial helicopter company, um, both as a as a flying instructor and uh, uh, and just as a, as a line pilot, I do recall on one occasion being asked to take a um, a jet ranger um, to uh, an individual's home um, where he was waiting to get in the aircraft and then fly around for the day. So basically, I was going to um, deliver his aircraft, stay with him for the day, and then come back and. Um, uh, it was his helicopter, um, so we, we flew out of the airfield. Um, I found um, his uh, his mansion, and it was an enormous mansion, uh, with his own helicopter pad with all the lights. and um, And as I approached the land, I saw Range Rover coming up the other way. Um, he stopped, um, and um, uh, and I um, uh, I got out the um, got out the aircraft with the blades windmilling to a stop. Walked around, um, and he got into the. Um, um, uh, to the right hand seat uh, and from the very beginning he was unbelievably aggressive and and rude uh, and what it boiled down to was that his wife would not let him fly on his own because <laughs> the few occasions that he even flying with him she was so alarmed at the way that his approach to flying that she said well you're not flying your own because clearly she had um, she had um, uh, her lifestyle to her to safeguard um, and uh, and this made him unbelievably grumpy. So to cut to cut a long story short, the first the first hotel that we went to because he, he he ran hotels and he was visiting his hotel, <coughs> and his first approach really steep uh, and way too slow. So another was approaching Baltic's ring parameters, um, and I felt that um, uh, on uh, on the first approach that um, it, that it was getting dangerous. So. Um, I, uh, I said to him, uh, I think you need to go around. And he looked at me and he just said, I thought I told you not to say anything. And actually he had, 
But his, his, his brief to me when he got on the aircraft was, um, right, I don't want you here. Um, is it, you're only here because of my wife. So you're to sit there and say nothing. <laughs> um, so I, I looked at him and said, your approach is too steep. If you don't overshoot, I will take control. So he overshot. And his second attempt was much better. Why? Because he was now paying attention to, uh, to what he was actually doing, um, rather than just being grumpy and aggressive. Um, and um, that, um, uh, that, that, that for me um, was again quite, uh, quite educational. The rest of the day went, went, just went horribly, as you might imagine, because uh, uh, that kind of set the tone uh, for, uh, for the day. Um, but there, 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 there are two types of people. There are those, there, there, there are those who believe in their own legend, uh, and then there are those who are always understand that there's something more to learn. Um, and, um, the, um, and he was definitely uh, a, a believer in his, own, in his own legend. In his mind, um, he, was a, he was a very good pilot and he just couldn't understand why anyone would have to be uh, in, the, in the aircraft with him. And he was absolutely the sort of individual who's, who was uh, going to get himself into trouble. Um, I had nothing else to do with him at that point. And when I, when I went back to the um, company, I said, are you aware of this individual's attitude? And they all started laughing and said, yeah, yeah, that's why we sent you. And I said, well, thank you for warning. said to all of us, Tim Curley, who's a former Red Arrows pilot and then became a helicopter instructor, he said to all of us on the course, the day you stop learning is the day you have to stop flying because you'll kill yourself. Yeah, that's it. And I, and I remember that, and I say that here, as Rich says it, the youngsters don't like to hear it, don't like to see it. And they just look at you strangely and go, why are you saying that? You know everything. And I said, I don't. Nowhere near it. Yeah, there's always something to be learned, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I have a bit of a personal question for uh, Richard Luck. Just, I was wondering, uh, where did you get your drive from to actually uh, pursue helicopter flying in the RAF? There's obviously a lot Absolutely. of people. Yeah, that is a great, like that's a great question. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, I, I, was, I was one of those um, children uh, who, from a very young age, was um, absolutely mad about aviation flying. Um, so, in my recollection, I've only ever wanted to be a pilot. I've only ever wanted to fly. Um, my route there um, has been slightly um, odd um, because I have a twin brother who's also an Air Force helicopter pilot, and he he joined the Air Force um, two years before um, I did, um, and. Um, uh, when he did, uh, I, I sort of thought, uh, thought to myself, perhaps I'm doing this just because my twin brother is. Um, so I decided that I would um, do something different. So I actually went into the hospitality business um, for, um, uh, for a while. And although I, 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 I enjoyed it, um, after um, uh, nearly a year and a half's worth of his, um, his pilot stories, um, I decided actually, no, I did want to be a pilot after all. Um, so initially I applied to the Army Air Corps, again, just to try and be different. Um, and um, as I was going through that process, um, I suddenly thought that actually, no, I wanted, I wanted to f have the opportunity to fly jets as well. So um, I, I then switched to the RAF and I was very, I was very fortunate to get selected um, back in 19, uh, 1986. Um, uh, and I started my flying training in, uh, in uh, 87. Um, and, um, and that, um, you know, that, that passion for flying is the one thing that, um, that has never left me. Um, and I left the RAF in 2009 and I, um, um, just after I was, um, a squadron commander. Uh, and then uh, after that, it was just going to be, um, desk appointments. Uh, and I realized, um, that that wouldn't, um, be what I wanted to do. I wanted to fly. Um, and if I couldn't fly, um, I'd go and do something else. Um, I then ended up in Kuwait as, as an air advisor, not as a pilot. Um, and um, Chris Veach, who's, uh, who's with us tonight, um, asked me if I wanted to um, uh, refresh on the Gazelle in order to instruct in one of the courses there. Um, and um, I, I thought about it for not very long and said, okay, I'll, let's give it a go. And uh, I remember the first day that we walked out to the uh, Gazelle on the dispersal was in August. Uh, in QA. So I think it was about 48 degrees as we um, walked towards uh, what, is, what can only be described as a greenhouse of a helicopter. 
Um, and as, uh, as we did our walk around, the, I could feel the excitement mounting. And then as we strapped in, you could smell the aircraft and the av tour. And, and I suddenly thought, you know what, I have really missed this. So we're talking about six years after I stopped flying. Um, and, um, uh, and, and thoroughly enjoyed a time out there. And then when I came back uh, to the UK and the Air Force eventually said, right, you know, what, what would it take to keep you in? I said, I'm only interested in flying. Not expected one moment that they would offer me the opportunity to do so again. Um, uh, but they did. And they said, well, would you like to um, fly the, uh, the Puma, which I'd never flown before? And I said, absolutely. So, um, so for the last six months, uh, up until um, July, uh, I was a student pilot all over again. <laughs> um, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying it. Um, but very, very aware of just how much <coughs> things had changed, whether regulations, uh, whether it had been, whether it was train techniques, um, uh, and um, but but at the same time, you know, a lot a lot hasn't. And if you've got a joy for flying, if you've got a passion for flying, then it's 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 never onerous. It's it's never work. You know, I just don't think of flying um, as work. You know, it's just it's just a hobby. Um, and if you can uh, if you can keep that keep that joy alive inside you, no matter how how tough things can get. Um, that it really just keeps you, it keeps you just coming back for more. Um, so, um, I, you know, I'm definitely a lot slower than I used to be. I'm definitely a lot blinder than I used to be. And my hearing is uh, quite a bit dodgy compared to uh, 1986. But you know what? It, it really doesn't matter um, because, um, you know, that, um, that, that, sheer, that sheer exhilaration, fun of being up in the air and, um, and doing uh, what a helicopter can do. Uh, it's just such a great motivator to get out of bed in the morning, uh, or indeed uh, late at night, as I'm tonight to go to go night flying. Um, you know, you just um, you just you just don't. Um, you, you know, if you if you lose that, um, then you need to question you know, whether you're, you've got uh, you know, you're sufficiently motivated to get back in the helicopter. Um, but um, you know, I envy you your age because you've now got uh, decades ahead of you to enjoy this. Um, whereas unfortunately, my uh, my time is uh, is running out. Um, but I intend to fly as long as I can until I'm, I'm dragged out kicking and screaming in my wheelchair. Uh, we is, there, see. Richard, is there an age limit in the in the um, in the army? The, um, the, it, there was, uh, and there is, uh, <coughs> in as much as the age limit used to be 55. So regardless of um, uh, how fit you were, at uh, 55 you had to stop flying. Um, uh, it is now 60. But from then on, it's done on an annual basis. So if you can pass the medical on an annual basis, then you, will, you can carry on flying. Um, uh, and obviously, at that age, it's not so much the yeah, frontline um, stuff. It's, um, it's more the standards, um, training, uh, evaluation type, uh, type appointments, um, which um, you can usefully bring um, you know, decades of experience to. Uh, and um, and continue to add uh, continue to add value. Well, that's uh, unfortunate at the moment is that I still get some of that frontline stuff as well. So I'm off to Kabul in October for three months, um, and I'm beside myself with excitement. I mean, uh, almost childishly so, uh, because I've never been and I've always wanted to go. Um, following the footsteps of Alexander the Great and uh, Robert Byron and uh, uh, and. Um, uh, Bruce Chatwin, um, to name uh, but a few. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, and, and, and this is what flying can do for you. It can really add um, uh, you know, considerably to one's life. I'm, I'm, I'm quite glad, Catherine, my wife's not listening because you just said about flying is just joy. It's not even going to work. And I have to really sort of push that point. I'm definitely coming. <laughs> <up here. laughs> I'll have a word with her. No, she's right. <laughs> yeah. At the time when Gren, Rich and I were flying around the desert one day and it was a lovely morning, it was nice and cool. And we were flogging around the desert at 100 feet doing wing overs and doing quick stops and things like that. And we just looked at each other and said, we're being paid to do this. <laughs> and it was a huge grin on my face. So mili military aviation is great fun and, and you're being paid to do it. Um, there are challenges that are involved with it, but I would still recommend it to anybody. Um, it is a really, really good way of getting into aviation. 
it certainly opens up your career path when you come out if you if you do decide to do it that way around that's for sure there's a whole wealth to open up to ex-military pilots because of the experience they've gained and, and like rich I, I i class myself as exceptionally lucky uh, at having achieved what i did with the raf because i wear glasses i'm short-sighted so I went to, I always wanted to be a helicopter pilot. I watched the Whirly Birds as a, as a young boy and I just wanted to fly helicopters. I never wanted to fly jets. I've had no desire to fly anything that's, that makes you feel sick. Um, and I've got no desire to fly or drive a bus either. So multi-engine didn't do anything for me. It was always helicopters. So when, the, when, they, when they told me I was short-sighted, I couldn't join the Navy. So I joined the Air Force as an air traffic controller, did a full tour and then transferred and was lucky enough to get through it oh. and not look back since. So for, for anybody, if, if you want to do it, it, it is an option. If you can get through the front door and you can pass all the selection and get through the, the interviews, I would strongly recommend it's, it. Um, it's, you're never too late um, uh, if, uh, if you want to try something different. Um, and I can see a tremendous um, spread of ages in front of me uh, on the uh, on, on the screen, um, and that's the joy of aviation is that um, uh, is that um, you know age is not is not a barrier, um, but not, neither is um, uh, uh, your your physical condition because you can get oh, exemption. Sorry, so Paul. I on on that note, Richard, do yourselves do the pre-flight check, climb up the side of a helicopter, look at the Air, uh, Air Force and that, or do ground crew do that? Because I wondered with those with the prosthesis and that, how they got around it. Right, we um, we do have a um, we have a, a two stage process. So the um, the first part of the aircraft preparation is done by our ground crew. Um, uh, obviously, very very professional, um, and um, um, when we we then sign for the aircraft, at which point it becomes our property, if you like. Uh, and then uh, we um, have to do a, um, a walk round uh, as well. But that walk round has changed uh, over the years. So in, in, uh, when I first started, we would clamber up, up the helicopter, over the helicopter, check the panels, um, uh, on occasion open a panel just to, uh, if we weren't satisfied. Um, but now we're not allowed to do that. So we, we do a physical walk round, but it's, it's eyeball, checking levels, checking panels, um, making sure nothing's missing um, and looking for any obvious signs of, um, uh, of, of damage. Um, uh, so um, uh, so things, things have changed uh, a bit. Um, but, the, uh, but the issue with physical disability is, um, you know, we, again, our appetite for risk um, has changed enormously. Um, driven by um, so, many, so yes, we do do our own walk rounds, um, but the engineers do uh, do the prime, uh, do the do the main one, if you like. Um, and in fact, um, when we are away um, from uh, the home base, uh, we as air crew are no longer allowed to do um, uh, the um, the turnaround servicing, uh, which which Chris and I grew up with. You know, we would go somewhere, shut down, do the turnaround servicing, do the before flight and after flight if you were shutting down overnight. We can't do that anymore. We have to take our own engineers. It's landed. Right. You want to ask something, Chris. didn't you? Yes. Um, so this, this is for Richard. In, in an operational thing, especially in the desert, if you're approaching a landing site um, and you start your flare and you just get covered in, in dust and sand and the rest of it, what do you do? Um, that's, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good question because it actually it applies not just to the desert. You can find these conditions in the UK. You can find them in the summer. Um, um, uh, and, um, and you can certainly find them in the winter uh, as well. So you might have a private field and it's snowed. Um, the conditions and the risks are exactly the same as flying uh, into, into um, desert sand. Um, the, but we, we now call it degraded vision environments because uh, it can be caused by, uh, by, any, um, uh, by anything, with, whether it's snow, whether it's sand, whether it's just <coughs> um, And we have um, uh, very specific uh, procedures um, that, that, uh, that we follow. Uh, the way that we used to be taught it was very much a, a handling exercise um, based on 
a, a standard operating procedure, um, but we just we just flew it over and over again until it became muscle memory. Um, and Chris and I did that uh, in the desert. We, we 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 did it in Norway. We used to go every year to Norway to do the snow landings. Um, uh, I said, now we've we taken it on a level. Um, they've labelled it de degraded visual environment. Um, to um, and if you like, we've added a lot more science to it um, in terms of um, um, procedures. Um, so um, gates, approach gates um, uh, at certain heights, at certain speeds, um, uh, rad out settings, um, um, settings on uh, things like the horizontal situation indicators or, or digital moving maps, um, whatever your aircraft is, uh, is equipped with. And then very, and, and also, but very importantly, the communication across the cockpit and from, and from the back into the front as well. So it's a continual information loop, both verbal and visual. Uh, and if we and if you don't make those gates on the way down, um, then it's a then it's a mandated um, uh, go around. Um, but we also have now have um, on the Chinook and on the Puma and on the Merlin um, very powerful um, uh, digital um, autopilots. So um, uh, we can we can actually take bring the aircraft down to. Um, a certain um, um, gate and then hand, hand the aircraft over to the autopilot. The autopilot will bring you to a perfect hover at, uh, at a designated position. Um, or indeed you can be at altitude um, and then hand the aircraft over to the flight management system and the aircraft will fly you to the point that you have designated um, along the track that you have determined you wanted to fly. Um, so there's many ways of, uh, of approaching, uh, approaching it. Um, and um, so we're taught three different DVE uh, methodologies. One is fully automatic, one is semi-automatic, uh, and one is completely manual. Um, and um, uh, it um, it seems to work because the certainly the uh, the accident rate um, has reduced significantly um, uh, over the uh, uh, over the years. Um, but again, it's about having a procedure in place. It's about having about knowledge of the procedure. Um, that that muscle memory does help enormously uh, as uh, as well. And it's about investing in the right kit um, as well. Um, uh, which again, unfortunately, comes back to all of that is about training um, uh, and uh, and budget. Um, but um, the, uh, the the wisest thing you can do is that if there's any doubt, there's no doubt. Don't do it. Um, as I said, I, I've seen people go into a dust bowl um, just outside Farnborough, um, uh, Rushmore Arena. Um, um, yeah, and I've certainly seen people get themselves into trouble uh, landing in snow in a field um, uh, in, in Wiltshire. Because um, you know, uh, uh, it can bite you anywhere. The snow looks so benign, doesn't it? It looks so beautiful and you make this lovely approach to your airfield over this lovely softly covered and um, suddenly woof yep absolutely so for us we won't let anybody self fly higher if there's snow cover and there's you, you can't for instance approach the runway that's been cleared so that there's nowhere we'll let them approach over the airfield it's just it's just not worth the risk as i mean before before the days of autopilot um we um we uh, we used to um fly two techniques and one one was the um was the constant angle reducing speed approach straight straight to the ground. So there was no dawdling in the hover whatsoever. And um, which took a lot of judgment because you had to um, make sure that you arrived on the spot that you intended to arrive at with zero forward speed, just as you got engulfed in the, um, uh, in whether it's snow or, uh, or in sand. The other technique uh, was to come to a high hover and then gradually reduce your height. And the idea being that you would blow away the particulates. Uh, and then as you got lower, more blew away. So you could just increasing, uh, increase, um, um, uh, increasingly um, get down closer and closer to the ground. Uh, but some places, it, you, you just can't blow it away. It's, you know, and certainly in the desert, in some places, um, uh, you, um, it would just keep on, keep on blowing. Huge, huge clouds um, of it. Now that first, that first technique, Richard, <coughs> we, we know that's a zero-zero. 
And it's, um, it's one I often ask people uh, that, that when they're having a bit of a check ride, just to a zero zero back of the airfield, but I want it on a particular spot, like a moan square. And it seems like such an easy maneuver, doesn't it? It's, uh, all you've got to do is just fly a constant angle straight down to the ground with, and touch the ground with no forward movement and don't end up in the hover. And it's the one that people find the hardest. And that's being able to actually see everything without you know, having a load of dust around you, etc. Yeah, it's a trick. This the crewman, sorry, this is where the crew becomes particularly helpful because what they will do is they will, they will talk um, to you about where the, uh, where the developing cloud is, whether it's a snow cloud or a dust cloud. And so they will say um, behind the aircraft, at the tail rotor, halfway up the boom, at the cabin door, coming forward to the cockpit. Um, and hopefully by then you're, uh, you're on the ground. Uh, if you haven't actually made that landing as it as it comes through, then you need to go around, and that's where you need to have um, already decided what your escape heading was going to be. Uh, you need to have decided what height you were going to have to climb to, um, and um, uh, and and at the same time, be absolutely clear in your mind that you would convert to instruments. It would have to be an instrument departure. Um, because if you try to continue flying it manually, again, as soon as you drop the nose, for example, then you've got those somatographic illusions, and we talked about term illusions earlier on, where you think you're doing something else because your ear, your your, your ears are obviously telling you something completely different, um, and um, you know there's real risk at, at that stage of flight. Um, uh, my my recommendation is to do lots of them with some with someone else who's experienced in it uh, before you attempt to do them on your own. Um, what tends to happen is a lot of people, um, uh, again, come back to the you know, uh, um, sort of living legends who believe that they are more than capable um, and they will try it, um, uh, you know, uh, going back to their own strip or back to their own um, uh, field um, and end up, um, you know, uh, catching themselves out. Um, most accidents um, are, are low time um, PPL um, holders. Who haven't, haven't got that experience um, to uh, to just give them that warning, uh, that warning uh, alarm in the head, um, as, as, uh, as the captain was uh, referring to um, earlier, that something is wrong kind of feeling. Um, so, uh, 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 and again, I I'm all right because you know, the military pays for me to go and train, um, but I you know, but I do appreciate that um, in, in the in the civilian world, um, you know, this is a, an expensive proposition. But what costs do you uh, do you place on uh, on making sure that you continue to enjoy your flying? Um, there you have it. Safe fun flying. Thank you, Richard. That's very, very interesting. Thank you. Hmm. Um, on in the in the civilian world, it's um it's only two hundred and fifty hours where you you get to that critical point. Quite often, that you think you know more than you really do and you become a little unsafe at that point then you pass for a couple of other waves but 250 hours is is often recognized as being a little bit of a, a crucial moment where you bring me careful in your flying but when you are mm. actually flying work wise on maneuvers etc are you in the same helicopter all the time or whatever's out there you take <laughs> um we um we are trained to fly um, uh, and be current on one helicopter type there are there are a few appointments where you can be current on more than one helicopter type um, there are some appointments where you can be captain on different aircraft for the purposes of the um, sortie and tends to be evaluation sorties for example um, but no be, again be, because of risk management and risk mitigation, uh, we tend to stick to one um, aircraft type um, and try and become as proficient as possible uh, in, uh, in that one aircraft. Uh, and I think it makes, per it makes perfect sense. Uh, I was fortunate enough when I was at um, Odium um, in the 90s. Oh, that's frozen. That was tremendous. I was flying um, two and um, two aircraft types, but the Gazelle was a relatively simple platform, um, so I didn't have a particular issue um, uh, with that. I think had it been a more complex one, um, then 
it probably would have been um, just just too demanding to be you know competent uh, on on both types sufficient to go and do um you know operational tasks um so um and again, I know a lot of people like collecting lots of aircraft types and having ratings on lots of aircraft types, but all that does is it dilutes your ability to respond to the, to the unexpected on, on whichever aircraft you're flying at the time. And it's very easy to, uh, to jump types, um, to do the wrong thing in the aircraft that you're in, but, but could have been the right thing in the aircraft that you flew last. Um, uh, and again, that's one of the reasons why we don't tend to um, fly more than one aircraft type um, at a time. Um, I mean, uh, even even I find that um, sometimes I will I will instinctively react to something based on a different aircraft type that I've flown in the past, and um, and I'll say, ah, that'll be the Chinook then, or that'll be the Merlin. Uh, in fact, Chris, you'll laugh. I did something which was completely gazelle last week. When I was asked well, you know, why, I just said, I think I reverted to a previous type. So easy to do. Um, so my, my advice uh, would be to uh, concentrate on one type and try and build up as much time uh, and competence on that one type uh, as, you, uh, as you can. Uh, and then when you're ready to go for something different, then, then move on rather than add to. Um, yeah, if uh, you know, if safety is is uh, is foremost in your mind, um, as I said, I know a lot of people out there um, who uh, who like to fly as many different types as they can uh, all all the time. When things are going well, that's great. But when things don't go according to plan, um, that it can come back to bite you. So with thank our, you, for Colin. With our um, students that pass, quite often, for instance, they they learn to fly in the R twenty two. And um, the, one of the questions that gets asked straight away is, when can I do the type rating on the R44? Now, thankfully, it is really just like a big R22, smoother, more powerful, it, it's easier to fly. But we'll say to them, you know, no, you need to accrue some hours, first of all. You need to gain some experience in, although you've learned in the R22, you spent your entire PPL in there, but you now need to go and explore with your new license in that one type that, you've, that we've made you safe in before you can entertain a new type. Um, yeah. Yeah, similar sort of thing, you know, we, we won't just let them jump willy-nilly from one helicopter to another because of your potential reactions will be incorrect, reverting to a previous type. How long does it take you to change from one machine to another? Well, ours, I think, is five hours, isn't it? So if you're going from the 22 to the 44, it's five hours flying. What is it, for instance, on a Chinook, going to do a Merlin or something? Well, I'll tell you what it was in a Puma, because I've just done that. So mm. I did um, a six-month operational conversion. Um, I flew 55 hours on the aircraft um, and I flew a similar amount uh, in, the, uh, in the simulator. Um, and I considered myself just about competent um, to operate the aircraft um, at, the, at the end of that um, across about 70 percent of the um uh, of the mission profiles um the other 30 percent i we, we just didn't have time to do in the course um so um i'm i'm a firm believer in the more training you can do um the more you will enjoy your flying um because there's the, you'll have less you'll have less uncertainty and less doubt uh, about what it is that you are uh, you are doing um, uh, with the aircraft at any at any given time, and I'll bring, I'll, I'll relate the story. When I when I converted to um, the Jet Ranger and Long Ranger, um, I I did three hours of flying. That was my conversion to two types. Bear in mind, I'd never flown either tonight before. I'd only ever flown military helicopters in a military environment. How competent do you think I actually was with a jet ranger and a long ranger after three hours of conversion? Uh, well, I was utterly terrified every time I went to start those aircraft. Utterly terrified um, because um, uh, um, 
it was just not enough. Uh, but also, um, much to my um, uh, much to my surprise, you know, every jet ranger and long ranger cockpit was different. Yeah. You know, apparently, apparently buyers can spec the cockpit to their to their own specifications. So, I recall on one occasion um, being late off for a departure, um, and um, I I had this particular jet ranger. I'm turning and burning, but I couldn't get any of the avionics on, any of the electrics on, <laughs> on the radio, and, and it utterly baffled me. And so I decided to go from first principles, and I started pressing everything that I could see on the console. And eventually, one one item moved, at which point all the all the avionics and the electrics came online. And so this one particular customer specified he wanted an electric cutout. And and of course, that was just that was just experimentation. At which point, I could hear air traffic moaning at me because I hadn't asked for start call and all and all the rest of it, uh, and rightly so. Um, but I was pressured to get going um, to go and uh, pick up um, an individual who paid a lot of money to be picked up at a certain time to take to a certain place. Um, and I, and I I just remember those. I only, I only did one season because I said after after. After that one season, I just thought, no, it's just, you know, I don't like the way um, uh, that I'm having to um, to operate, um, and I and I never got comfortable with those aircraft um, because uh, after that conversion, um, there was very little in the way of con um, uh, con continuity training. I was I was solo. I was off. That was me. Um, and um, you know, if I had a problem with something, then I had to find someone else and ask them. You know. Uh, so I had an awful lot of why questions uh, for quite for quite some time, and I never felt comfortable. Um, so I think um, I think the PPL course um, is, um, uh, is, uh, is 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 the bare is the bare minimum. Um, you know, it does what it says and it gets you flying privately, um, uh, but just be realistic as to um, um, uh, what you try and do going going onwards uh, again you know if you've got friends who are pilots um yeah, get them to fly with you um you know um to, you can you can identify each other's um, um bad habits and good habits you know uh, fertilization of uh, of ideas is never is never a bad thing um i fly with paul is that all right <laughs> <laughs> well, that comes, that comes to conversion to type um uh, again you know as, as as much as you can afford do um because the minimums are just that they are the minimum, minimum um, yeah. you can never do too much um sometimes you hear people they're sort of saying oh i only need to do 45 hours for the ppl and you specify you have to we have to keep reinstating no that's the minimum that is the minimum the chance of you achieving in 45 hours are slim to non-existent american lives yeah. I'm, I'm happy for anybody to tell me if i'm wrong on this because i don't have an american uh, helicopter license private one but if I remember, somebody did tell me that if you uh, fly anti-clockwise, for instance, Peter and Rotorhead helicopter, you can fly any of those any of those other ones that are similar to it without um, type rating training. There might be maybe one hour in the aircraft just to the differences, but completely jump quiet. So this this came about when. Um, a said instructor had an American license and we got our cabries. He said, oh, I can fly those. I said, yeah, but you need to do your type rating first. No, I don't need to. What do you mean? He said, no, my American license, because I fly this, an EC120, it's basically a Cadbury G2. So I can jump in that and off I go. And I was horrified. I was utterly horrified. What, having never, ever sat in one? Yep, that's right. Just get the manual out and just make sure I can start the thing and I'm off. Terrible. Mm. No, no, no. Sounds like a bad idea to me. Yeah, agree, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I know that Chris can um, back me up on that. You know, it's <clears throat> when, when things are going according to plan. Um, you know, it's it, 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 it's great, um, but when things start to go wrong, uh, and it's not just with the aircraft. You know, it could be with the weather. Um, um, it could be uh, an air traffic restriction that you weren't expecting. You know, you had planned to go through Bryce Norton's overhead. And Bryce Norton on the day say no, we're closed. Um, you have to you have to go around. Um, only you haven't um, you know, studied uh, 
the local area particularly, and suddenly uh, you're now um, concentrating very hard on one particular aspect of the flight. Um, you don't have an autopilot um, um, with, um, um, in order to, if you like, give the aircraft the, the, uh, um, the, the uh, control of the uh, height, speed, uh, and heading. Um, you know, you're in an R22. I think R44, does it have an autopilot? It can be fitted with a heli SAS, which is a pretty good bit of equipment, but then it's not a standard. That's something that would need to be retrofitted or uh, when you're specifying your new one. So no, it's yeah. a raw, you know, hands-on flying. There's no, there's no automation whatsoever, other than a governor. That's literally it. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen pilots, not military, um, get into an aircraft, and the first time they looked in the route is when they booted up the GPS. That's it. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's no way to go flying. Um, you know, our, our airspace is challenging, challenging enough without um, trying to shoot yourself in the foot um, like that. Um, so again, um, you know, preparation prevents um, poor performance. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Um, and we, we, have a, we have a rule of thumb that kind of says for every hour that you're going to be flying, you should do at least two hours of prep. That's a rough rule of thumb, but actually, um, you know, from experience, that kind of works out about that right, where isn't it? we need. And the more complex the task, the more time you need to um, need to have for the uh, uh, for the planning um, and route study. You know, if I can encourage you um, to uh, route study. And interesting enough, I was on a sortie um, yesterday where the. Um, the duty authoriser, and this is again this um, um, system that the military has in place, is that you might have a crew and a captain, uh, and they will plan and they will um, brief, but the duty authoriser is the one who ultimately signs you off to go and do what you plan to do. And the duty authoriser quite rightly picked up the, um, the crew for um, seemingly not being aware of some no terms along the route and all they've done was they used our electronic planning systems which is very good and very powerful and very fast to do a reroute but they didn't study that reroute <laughs> and on the new route there were no terms which were going to affect them and the duty authorizer said i'm not happy to sign you off at that moment go study your route make sure you're happy what those no terms mean how they affect you and um uh, and then when you're done come back and rebrief me and he was absolutely right. Um, but it comes back to um, this um, this notion of um, jumping in a helicopter is a bit like jumping in a car. No, no it's not. You know, in any car, I can pull over. You know, <laughs> any, pretty much anywhere. You know, on a motorway, it can be challenging. You'll get to trouble. But um, you know, you can't do that in a helicopter. Um, and um, uh, if you're single pilot. If, you're, if, you're, if you don't have a, um, uh, um, uh, an autopilot, three axis or four axis autopilot, um, then, uh, then you're asking for trouble if, you're, if your preparation and your planning and your route study, so you know where you're going, you know what your turn is going to be, you know who you're going to talk to, you know what squawks you need to um, put up. Um, and indeed, if you're going to an unfamiliar airfield, you've got the plate so that you know what the runway layout is, you know where you're going to park and phone ahead. Where am I going to park when I get there? You know, um, there, 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 there's no such thing uh, as a stupid question in aviation. Um, and the more that you know before you go flying, um, the more you'll enjoy the flight as you're doing it. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a simple, it's a simple equation. Um, I would, um, I think, um, I'll come back to um, just blob up a lot of the points that I've made before is that um, uh, it's never to become complacent. Um, it, it, it's the one thing that's going to get you into trouble. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're walking out to, um, uh, to a helicopter um, uh, and, um, and you're about to go flying and you, and you, think, you think you've got it all sorted, um, then, um, then you just need to have that little alarm bell um, just ringing. So I'll come back to my previous point, you know, prior planning prevents um, poor performance. Um, so um, so you, you should have good confidence in, in, in the sort of you're about to go and conduct, but at the same time, 
you always have to be thinking, what if something goes wrong? What am I going to do now? If I have an engine failure now, if I have an oil leak now, um, if my radio doesn't work, I mean, how many of you know what the no RT procedure is for recovering to L Street, for example? Can you recover to L Street with no RT? Um, uh, or, um, uh, or simple things like, you know, the weather is starting to deteriorate. What are your weather limits? Can you actually remember them? You know, are you, um, uh, as I, I, I overheard um, Thames Radar giving somebody um, quite a ticking off the other day um, because they were given um, a heli, uh, heli lane to fly along and they were half a mile displaced. Now to them half a mile, well, what was that? I mean, it's, you know, but to Thames Radar, that's a long way to be off track. And um, it was a case of get, get on track now or get out of my airspace. It was as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, um, Chris, the, the answer is, is, is never, never, be, never be complacent because um, that's, that's when um, you're, you're likely to get into trouble. And, uh, and you, know, you, you, you can never stop. You can never stop learning. You can learn from everyone. I, mean, I, I learn from juniors as, as well as um, peers uh, and, uh, and those who are re really now older than me, but certainly more experienced on type um, than me. Um, uh, you know, I, and I, you know, I do for, uh, at the moment to a lot of them, 20 somethings and 30 somethings who've got, you know, um, a thousand plus hours on Puma and five operational deployments to, uh, to Afghanistan. You know, I, I can't compete with that. No. Um, I can bring up more experience than there. Um, but, um, uh, it, um, you know, I, I, I definitely run the mantra, you, you know, I, I don't know everything and I can't afford to be complacent. Um, it, it seems to it seems to work for me. Don't get me wrong. I've had some very close shaves, probably too many times. Um, what did you learn from those close shaves? I, I've learned from them, and I've tried to get others to learn from them too. And I think that's that's really important um, yeah. because there are there are aviators who who will think I got away with that and then just hush it up. But actually, you've just you've just You've just gained some hard-won experience, and you're not passing that on. Um, so, uh, I think in, a, in, a, in an open and honest aviation environment, you should be should be able to discuss where you where you made a mistake, um, uh, and perhaps why, um, and pass that on, um, because um, you know, that might make all the difference to someone else another day. They can just think back. Ah, oh, I remember when Chris told me about um, you know, um, when this happened, um, and I'm going to avoid that, um, that uh, trap. I'm going to have oh, to brief, I'm going to have to find like, sorting out, um, hopefully with a, a, a brand new set of um, night, uh, night vision goggles, okay. um, but possibly not, we shall, we shall see. Um, but um, uh, it's been really great talking, uh, talking with you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd, be, uh, I'd be delighted to um, uh, do, do something similar again. Um, for, thank you. Um, but um, Chris Veach in that top right corner for me, um, another uh, another fountain of uh, of, uh, of hard won uh, knowledge and experience as well. So, uh, and I know that he's coming back to the UK soon. So, uh, a, a good resource to tap. Um, so, for all of you, if I don't see some of you uh, again, enjoy your aviating. Um, you know, that's 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 mission number one. Um, and uh, mission number two is to uh, stay safe. Um, so, good night to you. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. So, Chris, Chris Reed, we're about to see you in the world at the moment, then. I'm in Kuwait. Uh, he did say, didn't he? Yes, of course. It's the thing with Zoom, you've got no idea where anybody is. They, they, they're all just in the same room at the moment. <laughs> funny, isn't it? Being able to talk to people across the world. Oh, that's that was great for him to join us. Well, well um, uh, Chris, if maybe we could talk at a later date and see if we could um, invite you to, uh, to to back onto Zoom and talk about some of your experiences. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, please. That'd be lovely. Um, any questions, anybody, on anything we've discussed? There was one thing that Richard mentioned, and I don't know if I misheard it, a jack stool. Yeah, I'd love you to. You, you, you're not going to get that in the R22, so that's all to do with... <laughs>
I just have heard the expression. However, stall is a very, very, it, it's an aerodynamic phenomenon and it is gazelle related. And the simplest analogy is if you see someone at the gym pushing up weights lying on their back and you keep loading up the bar with extra weights, eventually they'll just go, I can't do any more. And that is what jack stall is. It's when the aerodynamic load on the rotor disc exceeds the hydraulic pressure within the hydraulic jacks that activate the pitch control rods. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. Just that. And all you do is just ease off the manoeuvre, lower the lever a little bit, and it all comes out of it. But again, one of the things that I did with Rich was we, we did it for real, and I showed him what it's like, and I showed him how to get out of it. So he was prepared for when he went into it with a Kuwaiti student. 